I'm excited. We've been uh, kicking off a brand new series called Super Power, and we are talking about the supernatural power of our Lord Jesus. And uh, so last week, as we jumped in, we began with the superpower of deliverance and talking about how God protects us. And so what I'd like to do is begin with a scripture today out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 4 and 5. So I always want to encourage you as well, don't get, um, what's the right word? Too comfortable to where you're not writing notes in church. When you write something down, there we go. When you write something down, I forget the percentage, but you're much more likely to remember it than if you don't write it down. And so you can write down the scripture references, and then you can come back to it later, right? And the Lord will utilize that to help reinforce the teaching. And that's the whole point, right? You know, when we're learning anything, especially from the Word of God, we don't want it to go in one ear and out the other, but we want it to take up residence and be cemented in our heart. All right, there's your pastoral thought for the day. Everybody say amen. amen. So we're going to write, so write this down, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. And I always encourage you to go back to your Bibles and highlight, uh, make notes. I know a lot of us use digital uh, means for the Bibles, which is fine. Just be sure if you're using an app or things that it can save things. Like if you're going to highlight something, you want it to be personalized. Otherwise, the, the digital apps, you really lose something when it comes to learning the Word of God. And uh, physical Bibles are always the best in a lot of ways, I find. It's a preference. Uh, I grew up on physical Bibles, but it's really beautiful when you can come back to it and see your handwritten notes. Or in my case, like I have Bibles from my grandparents and they're passed on. They're in heaven now, but I can see their notes. It's really special. So it's not sometimes just for you. It's also for your children or grandchildren, so you never know. Uh, when my grandfather was writing notes in the 1930s in his Bible, he probably wasn't thinking of me reading them all these years later in 2024. That's almost 100 years ago that I have in those Bibles. Isn't that special? So think of it from a family legacy point. So um, again, well, there you go. There's a rant. Amen. Okay. Uh, but let's read the scripture together. It says, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but everybody say, but, but, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power, everybody say power. power, the power of God. Let's pray. Father, for the next few moments we have together, Holy Spirit, speak through me as a vessel. Lord, let it penetrate the hearts of men and women, those present and those online, those who are not able to be with us. Father, I thank you, Lord. They can listen to this message right now or in a re recorded fashion later on. Lord, let these words just be sealed in our hearts today. And I thank you, Lord, that we will take away the revelation of your supernatural power in Jesus name everybody say amen. amen as we as we get into this this is one of my favorite passages of scripture and i think the reason is paul was speaking something that's so relevant today and you can put the scripture back on the screen for me because he said my speech and preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that it is very quickly teaching us that the lord operates not through human wisdom, okay, not through intellect solely, but the Lord is operating. Go back a, a scripture for me. The Lord is operating through the demonstration of the Spirit and power. So when we talk about how does the Spirit move, the demonstration of the Spirit is through power. So as we're talking about superpower in this sermon series, we are talking about how does God move in our midst? What should it look like? How does it look? How does it feel? What are results we should be looking for? Now, many times, especially in the day and age we're in with YouTube, I mean, there's a bazillion people online just writing words and getting online and trying to convince us of things, right? God help us. Thank you. The election's over. But, you know, when we hit political rotations, it's exhausting. I don't care what you believe in or don't believe in. I don't care what side you're on. It's exhausting. And um, it's everybody trying to persuade you to believe something, right? Paul was saying the same thing can happen in church, and it does, where you can get into arguments, spiritual arguments. When I began my journey of faith in college, uh, excuse me, 
I began my journey of faith when I was a child, but when I began a real deep dive of my ministry, that's what I'm trying to communicate, in college, I began to feel a burden to understand all other religions. Now, this was something I kind of put on myself in hindsight, but I'm like, man, I have time to study. I'm going to read. So I began learning about, uh, in my classes too, there, you know, you got to read the Quran. You got to read these Hindu documents. So I began to like, kind of get an appetite to learn. And part of the drive was, I want to be able, when I encounter different people of different faiths, to be very knowledgeable so that I can come to them and more or less argue them, you know, into Jesus, you know, as an apologist almost. And I, I believe there's a powerful uh, calling for somebody who truly is an apologist. I never felt that calling. I just felt this need, like I have to learn all this. And it was a self-imposed pressure. Now, what happened was, I joined this journey, and I didn't realize how many religions there are. There's a lot. And they all have a bunch of belief systems. And they got thousands and thousands of pages of documents for every single one. And as I began to attempt to digest all of this, number one, I, got, I kind of started to feel a little icky, to be honest. Because when you're reading demonically driven uh, uh, things, uh, and you're consuming them, your spirit starts to feel yuck after a while. The other thing is, too, I, I begin to feel overwhelmed, like I'm never going to accomplish this. And you know what? I believe that's true to this day, that I'd have to spend almost my whole life. I mean, we could spend our whole life just studying the Bible, much less trying to study all these other holy books, which I don't believe they're holy. I think they're man-made and man-made holiness. Now, let me tell you a quick story. So one of the times I got on an airplane and I was flying over to Europe and next to me was a brother from Tunisia. And he was a Muslim born from birth. And he was like a Muslim evangelist, okay? Um, and we got into a conversation about Jesus. So here I am trying to pull from my knowledge of Islam. And it was very limited. So I'd be like, doesn't the Quran? He's like, oh, it does, brother. But it also says this. And it says this. And it says this. And he starts pulling all these Quran things at me. And I didn't know any of them. I was like, yeah. He's like, in fact, your Bible says this. And he, I, I felt like he might know the Bible better than me. And all of a sudden, I felt very small, very ill-equipped, and almost like, this is what I didn't want to happen. You know, like I'm, I wasn't in college at this time. I was in my 20s. But I'm like, this is why I wanted to be ready for this moment. And I learned real quick, I wasn't ready for it in the flesh. Now, after he got done, you know, doing his best to try and convert me, which didn't work, um, he kept saying, Islam's an upgrade. That's what he kept saying. He's like, you know, like Microsoft, you know, like software upgrade. You know, that's what he kept going back to. Islam's the upgrade from Christianity. You have the old software. I got the new one. You need the new software. I mean, it was very logical to him. And I remember it was all done. I remember I downloaded these, these miracle videos on my phone. They were from A.A. A. Allen. They were from some modern things. But they were videos I had of healings, of supernatural power. Okay, so after like hours, because this was like a 10-hour flight, and I was sitting next to him, and I couldn't go anywhere. He finally tired himself out, and I was like, thank God. <laughs> and I remember finally the break came, and I put, put my uh, phone out there on purpose, and I felt in the, my spirit, just watch your videos. So I just turned on healing videos, and this guy, of course, he can't help himself. What is that? <laughs> what is that, man? Why is he getting out of the wheelchair? What is going on? Oh, that's uh, Reverend so-and-so. He's a Christian preacher. And when he prays in the name of Jesus, Jesus heals this person, and look what happens. And he's like, what? 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 Put the scripture back up for me. What was happening was all my five hours of conversation were in this part of the scripture. Human wisdom, persuasive words of human wisdom speech and persuasive words on and on and on but in the demonstration of the spirit and power that's what began to shift as i began to show him these videos he said that's different what i don't understand i don't understand yay go to the next verse now that's the point your faith should not be in the wisdom of men but in the power of god that we have to understand that faith is not established because we got convinced of it because if we live our life like, well, somebody was really convincing of my faith and I had an emotional moment. And so I, I gave them an inch and went ahead and said that prayer in the crowd. And so what happens when the storms come, and Lord knows they do, 
when the waves crash and when the winds blow, if your faith has not been truly rooted and established on the true rock of Jesus Christ, but on mere words of man, it will not last, it will stumble, it will fall because the faith was never established and rooted properly. Are you in the room with me? Amen. But when we see this, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, so if your faith is here, it's going to fall. But when your faith is established in the power of God, that's an unshakable thing. That's the supernatural power of God that we're talking about. And that's where your faith cannot be shaken when the winds blow and the storms come and the rains fall. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. And just in that simple example on the airplane, we had five hours of conversation, but in about 10 minutes with the demonstration of the power being in front of his face, his whole theology was wrecked. He said, I didn't think Jesus could do that. I'm like, well, you, you tell me. He's like, that's Photoshop. That's fake. I'm like, no, brother, this is the year 2000, you know, seven, you know, technology is not that good yet. AI doesn't exist. This is authentic. And he just, his mind could not comprehend. And now you say, well, did he accept Christ that day? No. He did give me his email. He says, I want more of this. Send me videos. And I remember emailing him all sorts of links. And I believe I just sent him. I never heard from him again. That was my encounter with this gentleman. But I did my best to send him down a path of finding something he had never experienced and never heard before. How many times is our faith established because somebody convinced us or some professor or some very wise person just spewed out on us for years and years and all of a sudden we're like well that's what dr so-and-so said so that has to be true but then when you encounter i i mean there are entire denominations that say god doesn't work in miracles god doesn't work in the power all that's done it's called cessationist theology and entire denominations base their entire belief system on that that only happened in the book of acts and anything beyond that isn't real it doesn't happen it's over it was fulfilled in the time frame ah But what do they say when I show them the proof? What do you say to this video, bucko? This is why our testimonies are so powerful. Because you can't take my testimony. What what happens when I tell them the testimony like Terry and I and the whole team in Costa Rica? When we watch the little girl whose bones were mangled with cerebral palsy in her wheelchair and it couldn't speak. And we watched God not perform one miracle, but many, many, many miracles as her bones popped into place. She got out of the wheelchair. She said, Mama, for the first time, you can't take that away from me. You, well, that was something else. I don't know what it would have been. I'm telling you what, that was a supernatural touch from heaven. And if you want to tell me it's not real, you can't take it away from me. We're going to disagree because my faith, scripture, please, was not founded on the wisdom of men. My faith has been founded in the power and demonstration of God. And this is why these scriptures are some of my favorite because Paul said, I didn't come to you with wisdom. I didn't come with you persuasive speech, and he could have. Paul was extremely educated. Paul was extremely respected in those regards. But when he came to the Corinthian church, he didn't come with that level. He didn't come up here. Reinhard Bunke said, you shouldn't preach. Jesus never said, feed my giraffes. Jesus said, feed my lambs. That the gospel message should be able to be consumed by any person at any phase of life. The gospel is not designed to be so complex that people can't grab a hold of it. In fact, it's the opposite. The gospel is designed so that any person at any facet of life can consume the meat and can be changed by it. That's why Jesus said, feed my lambs. It's down here. And watch as the power of God seals it in their heart. Everybody say hallelujah. Everybody say superpower. Supernatural power of God. We are not walking or living by word alone. We are only walking and living and should be having our faith sealed in the words of the Bible, which are supernatural. But there is a demonstration. If you've never seen demonstration, you're missing it. The demonstration is a part of the package. It's a massive part of the package. This is why religion is dead. But relationship with Christ has signs, wonders, and miracles. Everybody say amen. So last week we talked that God's superpower protects. We talked all about the supernatural protection of the Holy Spirit. If you missed it, go go to the podcast, go online, find it, catch up. 
I promise you, you'll be blessed. But today, I want to talk to you how God's superpower fights. Are you ready for this one today? If you are, say yes. We're going to talk about the supernatural fighting power of God in our life, how he goes before us, how he wars on our behalf. Even those songs we sang today, we didn't like necessarily intentionally pick them just to go along with the message, but man, they do. That when, when you say mountain move, they do. You know, the, these words that God is going on our behalf, fighting our battles, warring on our behalf, taking care of things that we weren't designed to take care of. God is a good God. Amen. In 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, again, write these down, type them in your phone. For every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve this victory through our faith. Hallelujah. I could preach an hour on that one scripture. Every child of God defeats this evil world, and we achieve it through victory through our faith. The victory comes through faith. There is an absolute guaranteed victory that Jesus paid. It's not a maybe. It's not a 75% chance. It's 100%. Every child of God defeats the evil world only through faith. Verse 5. Who can win this battle against the world? Only. Everybody say only. Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That the, the key to your victory, the key to unlocking the supernatural power and strength of heaven is not you. Obviously, we don't have that in and of ourselves. But the key is the belief in the one who does. And really the surrendering of our life into his hands and into his will and into his desires for our life. And this is why we talk so much about surrender. Because how many times do we hold back our full surrender to Jesus? Do you realize 90% surrender is a massive restraint? That if, you, if you're willing to give most of it, but not all of it, you will be massively restrained from experiencing the fullness God has for you. I've heard my, uh, our friend John Bevere say it this way. What um, husband wants to hear their bride say, I'll be 90% faithful to you? And what bride wants to hear her husband on the wedding day say, I'll be faithful 95% of the time. I just need 5% for me. I would not have accepted that deal. Neither would my wife. And I'm sure you feel the same. Why? This is a commitment and all in that we are forsaking all others except for each other. Are you with me? And so in our faith walk, the same is true. Who can win this battle? Only those who believe that Jesus Well, believe means 100 percent. We're talking about a full surrender that brings the victory. How many know there is a battle in this world? I asked earlier if any of you feel in a battle. I think almost every hand was raised. So the devil is constantly pulling against us. But when he does, God will fight on our behalf, but we can only do it through faith. We must have faith. When you experience a fight from the enemy, you will feel it in the natural. But it is a supernatural war taking place. But if you try to fight a supernatural war with natural weapons, you will lose. This is why the Bible teaches us we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities of the air and evil things in the darkness. The we Another scripture, the weapons of our warfare are not of this world. But they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. You cannot pull down strongholds in your life with your natural methods. The only way you can get certain strongholds pulled out of your life is through the supernatural power of God. How many would like to see that fully in your life in an area? Me too. It's only happening through the supernatural power of God. Everybody say amen. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. It says, fight the good fight for the true faith. Hold tightly to the eternal life to which God has called you, which you have confessed so well before many witnesses. This fight is not so much a physical thing as much as it is a mental and spiritual fight. That the wars we are coming against require something. And 1 Timothy 6, 12 says it. Hold tightly 
to your confession. That's another uh, translation of it. The one that says what you have declared so well, that's your confession. That's when you get before people. Maybe your water baptism was a part of that. Maybe a confession of sin to your spouse or a pastor or a leader in your life where you have laid it on the line and said, I'm going to really put this out there for real this time because I want to be free and I want to be changed. Guess what? You just entered a a new level of a fight. I don't want to fight. Oh, you want this fight because you're going to win. You know, nobody wants a fight unless you know you're going to win. Do you know the fight's been fixed? You know, did anybody watch the Paul Tyson fight? That was kind of like kids pawing at each other, right? I mean, it was a lot of hype for not much. (laughs) We had some teenagers at our house, and one of the girls, every time Mike Tyson would get hit, she'd say, poor old man. (laughs) Like, well, he is Iron Mike. He's so old. He was not that old, you know. (laughs) But we're talking about your fight. There's a fight, but the fight is fixed. You have victory, but the fight still exists. That the enemy, he's not going to quit just because you're Christian. He's going to try to do everything he possibly can to pull you out of your faith. And that's why the fight has to be on your knees and in prayer. That's why the confession of your word has to be daily. That's why your surrender is a daily surrender. That's why Jesus said, pick up your cross daily. This is not a one and done thing. Once saved, always saved. Don't believe it. I rebuke it, just so you know. Come against me, theologians. Let's go. Because it's not that way. Because if you think you can say some magical words and you're good, you've missed the whole process. This isn't about religion. This isn't about Hail Marys and grabbing your beads and making sure I did everything and now I'm good. Man-made religion puts all the boundaries in place for this thing. This is about a daily consecration. Jesus, I'm yours today. Father, I'm, today's all I got. Lord, I'm yours today. Take my life. Use my life. Where do you want me to go? I'll go where you want me to go. I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. Or not say. Supernatural restraint. It's part of the fight, too. Just because you feel justified doesn't mean you get to roar if it's not godly. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's a part of the fight. You activate God's fighting superpower by speaking your confession. Because it builds faith to believe in what God will do, and he will do it. You know, the Lord created the heavens and the earth with his words. He didn't make the heavens and the earth with his foot or his elbow or his ear. He chose words. This is why the Bible says death and life are in the power of the tongue. Your confession becomes your reality. What you say starts with what you think. So if you think it and then speak it, you have now given life to those thoughts. Do you know, just because you're tempted with sin doesn't mean you've sinned. It isn't until you act upon that sin that it becomes sin. Billy Graham said it that way. We're all tempted every day with sin, every one of us. I love Billy Graham. I think he's one of the greatest gospel preachers who ever walked the earth. But Billy Graham himself said it'll be tempted every day, but it's not sin till you yield to the sin. And the same is true with your thoughts. Just because you have a thought, you can put that thought under captivity. So you get a response. The thought comes. What's your response? Lord, I bind that evil thought in the name of Jesus. I have the mind of Christ. Father, cleanse my mind. Make me whole. I will do what you want me to do. Say what you want me to say. Go where you want me to go. Satan, you have no authority. I put you under my feet. Amen. And move on. Ah, but the, oh, the, the temptation comes. You might lean the other way. You might lean into whatever that thought is, and before you know it, you're walking in sinful actions that you know is not right, but your confession drives it. Do you know how much harder it is to sin when you confess that first? Why? You just gave authority back over to Christ when you confess it. So your confession has authority. Your words build faith. Now, let me take you back to the year 2016. What were you guys doing? Do you remember? I do. 2016. That year, we were in the nation of Albania. And uh, show that first photo. This is our stage. Now, you can't maybe tell, but this little guy in the blue shirt is Timothy. He was nine years old. He was really short then. Even Fatmer was taller than Timothy here. Now, Timothy's here. 
But if you look, if you look behind us, there's a mosque in the background. Can you guys see that? This is in the city called Tuman. This is our big gospel presentation stage. So on this stage, there was a declaration of God's love, God's deity, God's supernatural power. And I love it because here's Timothy at nine years old preaching to a crowd full of Muslims. He didn't say a lot like you would now, but the fact he did it is an awesome thing. Isn't it cool? He told him God loves you and I'm so glad to be here or something. And um, but we from that stage saw God begin to do miracles. Now, the next day we had a kids festival. So you guys ready? Let's go to the kids festival. 2016. Now, from that kids festival, we began a march down the street, and we had hundreds and hundreds of children. And as we marched, go to the next uh, photo, you'll see the crowds grew. And the crowds grew from the, uh, we probably had 250, 300 kids, I think, at the event, and it grew to like over 800, I mean, people. It just, the, the community was like, what's going on? There's a march happening. <laughs> and they came out. Go to the next photo for me. Here you can see we hit down the, it's now paved, but back then it was dirt. You can see Terry there in the middle. And these are some of the young men, some young teenagers that also were a part of this. And go to the next photo. Uh, then we began to serve all the children. So we had several hundred shoe boxes from Samaritan's Purse. We ran out of them. Luckily, my wife and her prayers and knowledge was prepared. And we had a lot of extras as well. And so the children were receiving gifts. And go to one more photo here and just hold that. And you can just see here the children um, going through. And so we had a, a wonderful little roundabout. And so they started on one side, they went through the church and they received a gift and they were prayed for and then they left. Um, what you're not seeing is Timothy was up in the window blowing bubbles. He was doing an amazing job. And, um, but we had a great time. We had a team there. And so this was a very exciting day. Okay. Hundreds and hundreds of children were blessed. Families from all this very poor area of Albania. And so we all, when this was finished, I don't have any more photos of it, but we'll hold this one just for, to take you into the moment with us. We went back inside this building. Now, this building is the Hope House, okay? It's the building Expect Hope purchased. We've renovated it. It's a beautiful building, church on the first floor, and child care facilities on the, the top floors. We were in there, and we were having a refreshment. Now, while we were having the refreshment, um, a commotion began outside. All the children had left, and we had gates to this compound, and this commotion began. Now, our main leader was gone for the day. He had a death in his family, and so we had kind of the backup leader and uh, just some helpers, that were, and that was it. And um, we could hear the commotion, and so we couldn't really see it, but we could hear it. And one of the, the ladies who was helping came in terrified, and she started making some confessions that weren't good. Her confessions were, we're all going to die, hit the floor, now, how many knows when you hear words like that come out of someone's mouth, fear comes in. That's how the enemy works, by the way. So what do we do? We all said, are you serious? And she says, we're all going to die, hit the floor. They're going to start shooting. Okay, so everybody got down on the ground now. We're like, we don't know what's happening. We do hear a commotion. And we're like, what's happening? So then another worker comes in. And so Terry and I are like, you know, crawling over like, what's happening? Why are we on the floor right now? You know, we just had this amazing outreach. We're trying to sip some water and coffee and hang out, and now we're going to die? Like, what is happening out there? And she said, all these teenagers are out there, and they are demanding presents because the children got presents. They want presents, and they, they said, we need presents. Do we have any more presents? We don't have any more presents. We gave them all away to the children. We literally gave almost to the exact number the amount that we had. And so all this is going on. They're like, yeah, uh, Pastor so-and-so is out there trying to talk to him, but it's not working. It's not working. These teenagers are like mafia in training. They all have pistols, and they, they do. They're, they're rough, rough young men, and they're ready to fight, and they've been trained to, and they demanded something, and they wanted a result. Now, while we're sitting there like, God, what do we do? And we're talking. Um, this crazy person runs by us with a bag of stuffed animals. That crazy person is named Bud Johnson. Hi, bud. 
but turning cameras today. <laughs> now, in this event, Bud had gathered up stuffed animals from his daughter, Molly, who's back there. Hi, Molly. You're part of the story today. Molly's stuffed animals saved our lives. Um, our kids had also brought stuffed animals. And we had kind of done all this with the intention of giving stuffed animals away to children. And uh, we hadn't used them yet. And so while we're all like hitting the deck, Bud, just in his spirit, just felt the Lord say, grab the stuffed animals and go give them to these boys. When he heard they need a present, he thought, that's the only present we got. I'm going to go give it to them. So Bud runs out to the gun-wielding teenagers and just starts handing them kitty cats and teddy bears and unicorns and whatever was in the bag. And he's like, God bless you. Like, here you go, man. You want a gift? You got one. And these poor, like, now what do you think would have happened? I think, are you kidding me? You know, pull the gun out. Kind of That would be not at all, though. The exact opposite happened. They received it with love. And they were so happy. Thank you. And they just walked away. They were sh showing off their stuffed animals to each other. Oh, what'd you get? I got a teddy bear, man. What'd you? Now think about now the whole thing calmed down and disbanded. And we were totally safe because our bus, our transportation was at the top of this long walk. There was no way out of this little alley. It was a dead end. And we have a bunch of angry young people with pistols. And we didn't have any pistols. Not that we needed them, but we were, we're what's my point? You will be in moments in life. You have to have the supernatural fighting power of God on your side. God fights for his children. God protects his children. God operates through faith. And um, I'll never forget that story. And that's why I wanted to show you some photos that we did and all those things just to take you there with us so you can kind of have an understanding. But God moves by our confession. And so here was the confession of fear that came in. But I'll never forget. I mean, Terry and I, you know, we're analyzing. We're trying to think. Bud did very fast analyzation and just ran. But the Lord was with him, and because of that, we saw a tremendous victory for God that day. Yeah, let's clap our hands and praise God for that. God will fight your battles. The devil will lie against you. He's going to try and harm you. He's going to try to bring accusations against you. But Psalms 109, I want to conclude on this. Psalms 109, 29. Let my accusers be clothed with shame, and let them cover themselves with their own disgrace, as with a mantle. Have you ever had somebody come against you before? Lie about you, say horrible things about you, or gossip about you, or whatever it be. Don't you want to react in the flesh? Especially when you feel justified, or somebody calls your character into account, or whatever the story is. But the scripture says, put it in my hands. How many times do we not do that? We just react. I got to defend myself, my whatever, my character, my integrity. I'm sure there's a time and a place for all those things, but many times when you read Scripture, hey, T, I don't know if maybe you could jump up for me today. Thanks. We flip-flopped. It's fun having a son who does so much. Everybody, give Tim a hand. Come on. <laughs> but Psalms 109.29, let my accusers be clothed with shame. That's nothing you're going to do. That's something the Lord's going to do. Let them cover themselves with their own disgrace as with a mantle. That's a heavy scripture, isn't it? But when you grab a hold of that, you know what begins to happen? You can actually begin to pray for your enemies. Do you know Jesus taught us to pray for our enemies? Jesus said, pray for those who come against you. Pray for those who curse you. That our job is to just say, Lord, help them. Lord, I'm going to release this off of my shoulders, God, into your, into your life. You know, and in that moment in Albania, we had some accusers, didn't we? Right in your face. It wasn't even through, you know, Twitter or something, well, X or <laughs> You get the point. It wasn't through social media. It wasn't just some blanket thing. It was real people with guns, angry, and something had to happen. There was accusers at the front gate, literally that building. But through prayer, through wisdom, through guidance of the Holy Spirit, through faith. Bud took a second and he just ran out there and did what he felt the Lord tell him to do. 
And through that act of kindness, that act of love, that act of generosity, it's amazing. God utilized that to take care of the situation. And you know what's beautiful? I don't think those children, because they were children, had to wear disgrace as a mantle. But you know who did? Satan. Here he came thinking he could scare everybody and threaten us. No. But with God's act of love and kindness and mercy, the children were able to be blessed. But Satan wore a mantle of disgrace that day. And God got all the victory. Come on. To this day, we get to talk about God's protection. And I want every one of us in this room to understand that that protection is here for us today. So right now, if we could, we'll just pull the lights back a little, and I just want to pray. Father, I thank you for your supernatural protection on our lives, for your grace and for your mercy. Lord, you have called us not to fight our own battles, but Lord, to have you fight on our behalf. Lord, I know that through so many struggles and so many problems we come against, your word declares there is a fight of faith. But Lord, I thank you when we surrender it back to you. Holy Spirit, you do the fighting for us. So God, we praise you. We praise you for your mercy. We praise you for your grace. We praise you for your hand upon each and every one of our lives. And Lord, sometimes you tell us to take action. Sometimes you tell us to do something. Sometimes you tell us to grab a bag of stuffed animals and deliver it to the children. Other times you tell us to be quiet and silent and pray. Other times you may tell us to do something different, but Lord, we're gonna be obedient to what you say and let you fight the battle. So Lord, I thank you, Lord, over this church. You're protecting it. I thank you over our individual lives. You're protecting us. I thank you over our families. You are protecting us. Lord, I thank you over our businesses, over our places of work. Father, you are protecting us. So Lord, we ask for your supernatural power to lead and guide our footsteps. Lord, to lead and guide us into the areas that you're calling us into. And this morning, I just feel led for us to pray now against the things of hell. Join with me. Because Satan, you have no authority. And we come against you in Jesus' name. We rebuke any spirit of lying. We rebuke any spirit of, uh, of division. We come against it in Jesus' name and we muzzle the mouth of of the enemy this morning through the authority and power of Jesus. The blood that was paid on Calvary for all of us. Father, I thank you that, Lord, that is our authority as believers. And so, Lord, today, we thank you. We are victorious over the things of hell. And Satan, you might come against us, but you will lose every time because Jesus already won the victory on the cross over 2,000 years ago. So, Lord, today we don't stand on our own strength. We wrestle not against flesh and blood today. The weapons of our warfare are not of this world, Father, but, Lord, they are mighty through Christ who strengthens us. So, Lord, today I thank you for supernatural warfare taking place on our account. God, we put it out of our hands, and we put it into your hands. So, Lord, show us how to handle those who come against us. Show us how to pray for those who try and destroy us. Show us how to rest and trust in you. And, Lord, tell us what to do, and we'll do it. Give us the actions we're supposed to take, and we'll take them. Lord, we are on your side, and you are fighting our battles. So, Lord, today we give you all the praise, glory, and honor for this. And we just lift your name on high and say thank you for all you're doing. We say thank you for the victory even before it's won. Hallelujah. And, Lord, I praise you that, Lord, victory is on the way. Hallelujah. So, Lord, we praise you. We shout now even before the walls fall. Father, we shout now by faith declaring that, God, you are warring on our behalf. And, Lord, you have called us into victory. So, Lord, we hold on to that wholeheartedly and say thank you, Jesus. We may not know how, but your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So, Lord, we praise you that you're doing things we don't even know about sometimes. We thank you for the mysteries that you operate in. And, God, we give you all the praise, glory, and honor for it in Jesus' name. If you believe it, would you clap your hands and say amen? 
Amen and amen. You guys, I encourage you this week, whatever your battle is, seek the Lord. Don't just seek your own action. Seek the Lord for his action. He'll speak to us on what to do or what not to do. Seek him first. Don't allow emotions to lead the charge. Emotions lie to you. The flesh works through emotions. Just because you feel it in the emotions means nothing. Surrender that to the Lord and watch what he'll do through that yielding. Amen. All right, God bless you. Come on, let's give God one more clap of praise. I want to thank you for being in church today. You guys, next week we're going to have communion. I'm also going to preach the final message of our superpower series. We're going to talk about how God's superpower provides for us. You're not going to want to miss it. Be here next Sunday. Everybody watching online, God bless you. Thanks for watching today. And um, have a blessed week, you guys. We love you all. Thank you. Hey, thank you so much for watching today, and I pray the message was a blessing to your life. If you want to stay up to date with all things Expect Hope, subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on social media. You know, we can't do what we do without you. And if you'd like to make a donation to our ministry, please go to expecthopechurch.com. You know, it's impossible to meet all the needs without so many faithful supporters just like you. Thank you for your consideration. And if you're ever in the Denver area, we invite you to come join us for a service on Sunday morning. God bless you.